excellent book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, uh, he talks about parasites, and he's talking about social parasites. And what he, what he says is that these people who he describes, again, as social parasites, he says they will find your weakest point, and they will feed off of it. It's a really, I mean, it's a, it's a rather obvious, but of course it's a very clear analogy. Social parasitism, which ultimately is the same thing as political parasitism, they find your weakest parts and they feed off of it for their own power. That's a perfect example. Nietzsche says it beautifully. I'll try to put the quote into the video and I'll try to put the audio into the video as well. I form circles around me and holy boundaries. Ever fewer ascend with me ever higher mountains. I build a mountain range out of ever holier mountains. But wherever you would ascend with me, O oh my brethren, Take care lest a parasite ascend with you. A parasite, that is a reptile, a creeping, cringing reptile, that tries to fatten on your infirm and sore places. And this is its art. It divines where ascending souls are weary. In your trouble and dejection, in your sensitive modesty, does it build its loathsome nest. Where the strong are weak, where the noble are all too gentle, there builds it its loathsome nest. The parasite lives where the great have small, sore places. It divines where ascending souls are weary. In your trouble and dejection, in your sensitive modesty, does it build its loathsome nest. They will find your weakest point, and they will feed off of it. It's a really, I mean, it's a, it's a rather obvious, but of course it's a very clear analogy. Social parasitism which ultimately is the same thing as political parasitism, they find your weakest parts and they feed off of it for their own power. That's a perfect example. Nietzsche says it beautifully. I'll try to put the quote into the video and I'll try to put the audio into the video as well. So if someone has, let's say someone's racist or whatever, bigoted, or they have a, they have a need out of their own insecurity to look for some irrational justification to feel better than other people, right? So let's say somebody's racist and a politician out there wants power. Well, they know that, uh, you know, some certain uh, percentage of the population is racist. So they'll say racist stuff. It's called, ga uh, not gaslighting, even though it can be gaslighting. It's called dog whistling. So they'll say racist stuff in a very subtle way to kind of activate the hearing uh, and emotions of people who are racist so that they'll go along with whatever else they say. And I'm sure you know some recent politicians uh, who are, are rather famous for uh, what's called racist dog whistling. So again, if someone wants to take advantage of you or if they want to take advantage of me or if they anybody trying to look to take advantage of someone else, the first thing they look for is the vulnerability, the weak part, uh, the need. The, the loneliness, the, the jealousy, the racism. They, they look for you know, some type of weak point that they can latch onto and kind of you know, suck power out of it, so to speak. It's a, it's, a, it's a really good analogy, even though it's a little bit distasteful. So uh, racism is a good example. Social parasites latch onto that. Uh, politicians use it uh, in a form that's commonly called dog whistling. And they, they use certain code words, so to speak, to activate the hearing and emotion of those people who have that vulnerability, and that's how they gain popularity. So racism is a really good example. Loneliness is a really good example. Uh, if, someone wants, if someone is manipulative, like uh, a psychopath, if they're manipulative, then they instinctively or instinctively uh, read other people instinctively, uh, read other people for vulnerabilities and they'll find out who's lonely and they'll say, hey, let's be friends. And if a person isn't aware of their vulnerability, then they'll go along with that. They'll say, hey, hey, let's go get coffee. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, and the next thing you know, they're, they're being played for their whatever they have that the other person wants. So again, racism is a really good one. Loneliness is a really good one. Uh, being honest and 
fact-based and intellectual is another vulnerability uh, that people uh, will use as a, they'll turn it into a vulnerability and use it as a, as a way to kind of uh, gain access or gain advantage over someone. Uh, for people who are too, into, I don't want to say too intellectual, because obviously I'm talking about myself here. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, you know, being honest, earnest, trying to be fact-based, trying to understand the world from a, an intellectual standpoint. Uh, people who are manipulators will use that. And I, I've had it used against me. That's why I know about it. Uh, I read about it actually in that book uh, by George. Um, sorry, I'm trying to have to remember his last name. Simpson? Is that, that doesn't sound quite right. Uh, but the name of the book is uh, In Wolf's Clothing, I believe. Uh, and in that book, uh, in the last chapter of the book, he talks about vulnerabilities. And he clearly states that intellectuality and being honest is a vulnerability in the eyes or manipulative hands of someone who's a psychopath. So again, racism, loneliness, uh, earnestness and intellectuality, honestness, or just being naive. That's, those things kind of go together, even though each aspect of that is different. Uh, and in this case, just vulnerability, kind of global vulnerability. So why would somebody be globally vulnerable? Well, for example, let's say they had a traumatic childhood uh, and some bad, followed by some so let's say they were, uh, had a bad childhood, alcoholic parents, uh, poverty, uh, loneliness, depression, insecurity, low self-esteem, all that kind of stuff. So all of those are vulnerabilities, and a lot of people have all of those together. And, uh, and I'm not saying I don't. I mean, I, I grew up in kind of a dysfunctional family, which is, which is kind of ironic in the sense. So... I mean, we certainly had more than our share. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know what is the appropriate share of dysfunction. Uh, but we certainly had some dysfunction in my family. Uh, and I was, I was directly affected by that, of course. But I also uh, kind of rebelled against it, so to speak. So I, the parts that I were aware of, uh, I kind of rebelled against... But also certain aspects of it, I don't think I did this consciously, uh, but certain aspects of it, I also kind of resisted or uh, rebelled against, even though it was unconsciously. Uh, and, and that's kind of, those are things that shaped me. So anyway, when I talk about dysfunction, my only point, my kind of the point that I was making is when I talk about dysfunction, I'm not talking about, you know, all you people out there with dysfunctional families. I mean, it was my own family too. Uh, and some of that included racism. I mean, my, my grandparents were definitely racist. My grandfather on my mom's side, definitely racist. Uh, but why was he racist? Because he was poor and uh, uneducated. And, you know, he had to have somebody in his, on his social horizon that he could feel better than. And the only, the only people he could feel, but this was in, you know, Southern Texas, uh, I, I presume the only person, only people he could feel better than, uh, obviously it was dysfunctional, kind of the improper belief, but he, he looked down upon African Americans for sure. Uh, and maybe it was because that was his only salvation, so to speak. The only way he could feel good about himself was to talk bad about other people. I, I'm just kind of guessing his psychoepistemology. Uh, so anyway, Racism, loneliness, uh, honestness, earnestness, intellectuality, naivete, all those things can kind of go together. And certainly they went, to, went together in my case, especially when I was younger. Or let me say, I don't think I have that combination anymore. So I would say that particular combination applied to me when I was younger. I don't think it applies to me now. Uh, and, you know, like I said, dysfunctional families, poverty, uh, insecurity, low self-esteem, all of that is the big, you know, ball of wax that we call low self-esteem or what's being called here vulnerability. Again, we're all vulnerable. We're all going to die. We all have whatever our issues are or whatever. 
that's just normal human vulnerability. But why, why did TED as an organization, here's the issue, here's the question that I have. And this is the part that never really fit for me in this work. Why did TED as an organization want to popularize this idea? Why did TED, 